Welcome everyone to Green Acre. This is a Baha'i Center of Learning. We are online where normally we would be in person, but you know, this is an unusual year and we gotta do what we gotta do. So here we are online. Welcome to the room. My name is Jessica Gaines. I serve as the program coordinator here at Green Acre, a Baha'i Center of Learning. We are so honored to welcome Louise Prophet LeBlanc here with us tonight. I will intro her shortly. If you've never been to Green Acre, we're located on the banks of the beautiful Piscataqua River in Elliott, Maine, that's Southern Maine. This is the ancestral homeland of the Wabanaki. And of course, like I said, normally we would ha be having this workshop in person, but uh, we're not able to do that, obviously. And we are very grateful actually for this online format because it allows for so many people who would not be able to be here in person to be in the room and for that we're grateful. So part of Green Acre's mission is to elevate conversations, to elevate the discourse in society around themes of justice, nobility, the inherent worth of every human being, constructive resilience, and the oneness of humanity. We've been exploring these themes for over a hundred years here at Green Acre and we're committed to continuing to do so. So today's webinar will last for approximately an hour and a half or so. Louise will tell you a bit more about what to expect during the meeting. We're so pleased to have her with us tonight. Louise, would you honor us if you're comfortable by telling us your name in your own language as well as the name of the nation you're a part of? Yes, my, my real name is Ed Anna. And Tz'et Ana means beaver woman. And I'm from the Nacho Nayakdan First Nation from Northeastern Yukon Territory. It's part of the huge Athabascan tribe, Dene people. Thank you so much, appreciate that. So Louise is a traditional storyteller. Her 30 year commitment to the cultural and artistic heritage of her people includes being co-founder of two seminal organizations of the Yukon both of which helped to inspire an artistic revival and a recognition of indigenous art in the territory. Louise worked for several years for the Yukon Native Heritage Advisor, advisor for the Yukon government, uh, recording traditional stories relative to Yukon geographical place names. She pays tribute to the many elders she was privileged to work with for over a decade, ensuring these precious stories were captured for future generations. Louise worked for over 11 years to help advance Aboriginal art in Canada through her position at Canada Council for the Arts, where she served as coordinator for the Aboriginal Arts Office in strategic initiatives. Despite her full-time employment at Canada Council, Louise continued to respond to requests from regional and local Aboriginal gatherings, festivals, and inner city school programs, sharing traditional stories and providing a framework of curriculum for teachers to use in their classes. She was also privileged to be invited as a storyteller at international venues in Germany, Netherlands, Norway, Greenland, Scotland, USA, Belize, Hawaii, and many national indigenous artistic gatherings. And with that, we're so happy to have her. I'm gonna hand it over to Louise. Thank you. Masicho, thank you very much. Well, it's really my honor to be amongst all of you tonight. And I was expressing this earlier to Jessica that it's gonna be an evening of learning. For many people that are not familiar with the traditional stories of indigenous peoples, it's, um, I think this, this time that we're all living in is, and I'm not just talking about the COVID period, I'm talking about this era that we're living in uh, I think it behooves us to learn as much as we possibly can about the original peoples of Turtle Island, which people refer to as North America. And so I've made it my business to try and share as many stories as possible and to also uh, inform people of the practice of traditional storytelling. So I'll give it to you in a, in a nutshell. Um, of course, we didn't write. I mean, we didn't write with um, Roman orthography, but we wrote in, in terms of our artwork. We wrote in, um, by composing songs, different songs were composed. And so our history, our knowledge um, 
things that went on over a period of time within the traditional community were passed down orally. So I come from an oral tradition. What does oral tradition teach a people? When I was a small child and I had the privilege of living with my grandmother and she would tell stories. And it wasn't until I was much older that I realized that by sharing these memories with me, she was sharing how I should be, how I should um, behave in the world, how I should be in the world, how I should be considerate to everybody around me. It was a, it was a beautiful time because her friends would come and they would be speaking in two or three different languages, sharing stories, laughing. But I always um, uh, pay great attention when I'm in a room and there are elders there because they are full of story. And today, actually, I had a meeting uh, with two sisters. They're from Pakistan and they're very interested in traditional stories and making sure that the younger generation, their age, uh, have access. And so I think this is what's going on now across Canada, for sure, and the United States, is that young people are taking up the business of becoming language warriors to ensure that the language is retained, or in many instances, revitalized. And of course, if you know the stories, and you can tell the stories in your language, this will make it much easier to develop curriculum, if you will, for the younger, for the children and for other people who want to learn the language. So tonight we're going to learn together, as I said, we're going to hear a story. And this story, I think Sarah's heard this story. And so this isn't the first time that this story is going to be shared on a Zoom platform. But it was so amazing because Kitty Smith and her husband, Billy Smith, Chief Billy Smith, were Baha'is way back in the 50s and 60s. Of course, they've both gone to the spirit world. And she shared this story with me. And I have to give you a little bit of background. I was working as a mental health nurse. And at that time, we were having a crisis amongst the young people, particularly young men between the ages of 16 to 25. They were suicidal. There was a rash of suicides in every, every community in the Yukon when I was working, and this was during the 80s. And I, I just became so distraught. I was wondering why, you know, you're given such a, a short time here on earth why would somebody want to cut it shorter? So I went to this beautiful elder and uh, she was very kind. She welcomed me in. She said, you want tea? She made me tea. Um, many people knew her um, as not only Grandma Kitty, Kitty Smith, the wife of Chief Billy Smith, who was one of the kindest and, and a very wonderful leader of the Kwanlin Dunn First Nation. But Grandma Kitty had this unusual practice of carving. In her early days, women were not permitted to carve, but her father died, and as was the cultural practice if a man died and his wife was left with children, and if he had a brother, that brother would step in to father these very children. So her uncle, who became her stepfather, was a magnificent carver. Now her mother and her stepfather, who is her uncle, never had children. So he taught her how to carve. Very few people know this about Grandma Kitty Smith, and she used to show me pictures of her carvings. And there was one that was in the museum, and she told me the story about this man who he lost, he lost his earring. And anyways, it was another story that can, we can go on forever with these beautiful stories she shared. 
But what I'm trying to say here is that this was during the war. She said there was no way, there was no economic base for Indigenous people. So she said, despite the fact that I was not to tell anybody that I could carve, I waited until my stepfather passed, and then I started to pull out all my carvings. And I sold a lot of these carvings to the soldiers so that I could provide for my family. That was such a, a beautiful moment to realize the strength of this woman. She also had tuberculosis. That was part of her story. And she had tuberculosis in her hip. She was sent to a southern hospital of which many Indigenous people from the north were sent to the Charles Council Hospital, which is in Alberta. And she said, I was there for two years. Now, she said, you know, my husband was not, the, this was her first husband. He was very mean to me, she said, very cruel. I don't know why he was like that. And when I was away in the hospital, she said, he got married again because he thought I was dead. Because I can't phone him. I don't know how to write. I can't write him a letter. So she said, when I got back here, he was married again. <laughs> I was happy, she said. <laughs> so, and look at that, she said. Here I meet up with Chief Billy Smith, a very kind man. That's the one, she said, I have my children with Chief Billy Smith. So this, I just wanted to give you a little bit of personal information about this amazing storyteller. And every time I would go to her home and visit with her and sometimes lay my burdens before her, she would be so kind and she would give me a story. So tonight, friends, I'm going to share a story with you. And I think it's really relative to this time that we're living in. There's a lot of darkness right now. And she makes reference in this story to this great ability of people to create light. You know, there's a very beautiful Baha'i quote. It says, so powerful is this light of unity that it can illuminate the whole earth. So if we can just have that in our, in our minds. So as I was, when I was consulting with Jessica, I said, you know, I can just come and tell the story and that can be it. But what I would like to do to honor Brahma Kitty Smith is that we will have a workshop and I'm going to give you several things to consider as the story is unfolding, as you see it in your mind's eye, and only you will see it with your own eyes, you will hear it with your own ears, you will understand with your own mind what the story is for you. Because these traditional stories, they might be told to several people, but it's coming to everybody personally. So if you can just consider that. I want you to consider perhaps, and it's, you don't have to take all three of these. You might consider what did that mean in the past? What does it mean for the present? This story that you're going to hear from Grandma Kitty Smith. What does it mean in the present day? And finally, what do you think this story holds? For the future. Okay? So after I finish sharing this story, and you can be thinking about some of the metaphors, some of the symbols, some areas where you see there's definite justice, and what does that justice result in? What types of unity are established in the story? the strengths, the spiritual components of the story. Be thinking about those.
So after the story is told, what I would like is just to have a few minutes of reflection. And during that few minutes of reflection, I would like to sing a healing song for the world. I'd like to say a healing song for any of your families who are having a difficult time during this period of separation, I suppose. That's how it's gonna go down. I guess that's the word. That's how it's gonna go down. Now, I think, uh, Jessica, you said that you're going to, uh, there's going to be a prayer that will start the evening. You, you had asked me to sing, and I'm still, of course, willing to do that. Wonderful. And I'm sure okay. you want me to start with that? Okay. If you can kindly sing, uh, and, we, and during this song, let's just reflect on the power of story in song. Oh, Lord, teach us thy oneness and give us a realization of thy unity so that we may see no one save thee. Thou art the merciful and the giver of bounty. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Oh, Lord, teach us thy oneness and give us a realization of thy unity so that we may see no one save thee. Thou art the merciful and the giver of bounty, bounty. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Oh, Lord, teach us thy oneness and give us a realization of thy unity so that we may see no one save thee. Thou art the merciful and the giver of bounty. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch, one branch. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch, one branch. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch. Ye are the fruits of one tree and the leaves of one branch, one branch. I'd like to offer this prayer. It's in my language, the Northern Toshone language of the Yukon. And um, this is a prayer for protection for, for all of our families, our immediate families, for our communities, for our nations, for the world. Janak Neo Taulingi Agi Okanojik Hit A Hajuyat A Nitru Nankashu Agi O Taulingi Klahu Hagi The Tartnagi Kiagi O Yagi Natsa Ayat Sachu Natsa Mm. Grandma Kitty used to wear this coat and, and it was a fake leopard skin coat. She looked too cool. <laughs> yeah, I'm just thinking about her now. <clears throat> And so I want to honor her. <clears throat> I think when I told her that I was working um, to help prevent suicide is what made her acknowledge and, and find that this was the probably the most appropriate time for me to hear this story. As I was referring to um, another group, I said, you know, some stories, uh, in a traditional form, you hear them, but you don't hear them. 
They just go right through. And after the storytelling, you said, what was that about? This happens. And if it does happen to you, don't feel bad. It wasn't this story you were to hear. It's, all, it's actually a protection. And um, I've heard enough stories in my life, and not all of them did I actually retain or hear, because they're not, they were not for me. So I just wanted to have people just relax. Just think of yourself as sitting there with Grandma Kitty, and you're having tea at her place. Yeah, she said, you know, a long time ago, she said, this, he's a big chief. He's a sky chief. Here he got two wives. One is old woman. She knows a lot. And one is a young woman. They live up there in the sky world. They get along good. They do everything together. The old woman, she's teaching the young girl. They don't mind. They share a husband. In them days, it's okay. So she taught the young girl how to be a good person. What to do when she became a woman, because she was quite young. Now, one day, the young girl... She said to the old woman, I wish I had some children. I want to have a baby. Now, what she didn't know is that great sky chief there, he could hear your thoughts. Hmm. And he heard hers. And it wasn't long till she realized she was pregnant. Wow. She was so happy. Now the older woman, she got busy and she told her how to take care of herself when you're pregnant. You have to eat good foods. You have to have a beautiful space while you're pregnant because you're carrying a child. This is a sacred time for women when you're going to have a child. You're working with the creator the creator has allowed you to carry his creation. So this is not to be taken lightly. That's a big responsibility, she said. So the old lady told her, now, when you go along and you get bigger and you're going to have that baby, you got to have a special place to have that child. I'm going to make a birthing hut for you, she said. Little tent. I'm going to make it out of willow. I'm going to make it with a caribou skin. Only woman's going there, she said. Man can't go in there. That's the place when you're going to have that baby. Very sacred, very special place. When your water break, that's the same water. We all come from a salty water. Just like the sea water, we come from that. I'm going to make you a little bar that goes across so you can hang onto that bar. And me, she's the old lady told her, I'm going to hang onto your back when you squat down. I'm going to put a nice boughs there on the, on the ground and put a nice cloth there to catch the baby. It's not going to be hard for you. You're young. Sure enough, that young woman was carrying out some chores, working with the old woman. All of a sudden, her water broke. And the old woman already had the birthing hut ready. Come, come, she said. She took her in there. Breathe, she said. Breathe into every pain. Just breathe nice. Take lots of air in. Try to relax. So that young woman, she followed her instructions. Hmm. 
She hung on to that bar there. The old lady hung on to her back. Your beautiful baby boy come into this world. That young girl was so delighted. The old lady too. She helped her clean up that little boy. She kissed that baby. Welcome that baby. <laughs> now, as any woman knows that has had a baby, that's a lot of pressure on your bladder when you're going to have that baby. So that woman, after she finished cleaning up her little child there and she let him suck, take suck from her breast, she told the old woman, here, take my baby, I got to pee, she said. He has to go out of the birthing hut. So she went out. She relieved herself and she came back in. The old woman looks like she's in a state of shock. She saw the baby was dead. What happened? And the old woman pointed her lips. The husband was outside of the birthing hut. He had taken the life of the little boy. The baby. Oh my God. Grandma said that girl, she just was in shock. Why? Why would he do that? Maybe he knows something about that boy. When he grows older, maybe he's not going to be a good man. She's trying to justify what had just happened in her mind. Well, her and her old friend, they gave that baby a proper burial, pray for that baby. She tried to detach herself from that, what had just happened. So time went on. Here again, she wished for baby. But this time, she called out to her creator, let it be a girl baby. Maybe my husband is jealous for another man to be here. She's trying to understand. She's trying to make some sense of what has happened with the first baby. So she said, I wish for a girl baby. So the old lady, when she got pregnant again, the old lady did the same, took care of her, made sure she ate well, surround her with beautiful things, helped her to become more patient, had her sleep every day in the afternoon. She said, you know, when you sleep in the afternoon when you're carrying your child, when the baby's born, he's going to want to sleep in the afternoon too and give you rest. So that's what she did. Again, the gush, the water breaking, the salty water. It was another boy. Oh. That girl was very vigilant. When she had to relieve herself, she put the baby, tied the baby around her and went out to take a pee. She never let her, not for one moment, she never let her guard down. She watched him with the eagle eye till he was about two. He was walking around inside. She just stepped out. It took such a short time and she found her baby dead, her little boy. She just went crazy, screaming, hollering. And she went to that sky chief. 
why, she said, why you do this? This is your flesh and blood. Why you take our boy? She just pwned him up, fell to the ground crying. He didn't say anything. Well, that woman and her friend there, the older woman, again, she had to bury her own son. She was uncontrollable in her grief and crying. She couldn't sleep. She couldn't eat. She couldn't do anything. She just, she wanted to die. So she spoke to the old lady and she said to the old lady, I'm going to go up the other end. It's like an island. I'm going to go up there. She said, I can't stand to even look at him. I can't be here anymore. And the old lady said, I understand, my girl. I'm going to miss you, but I understand. And she helped get her things ready. And the young girl went up. When she went up to the other end of that place, she never knew this, but there was a sea there, water coming. Huh. And then she knew what she was going to do. She put all her stuff at her little camp there. She took her blanket. Grandma Kitty said, it's go for skin blanket, she said. And she went and laid down beside the sea and waited for the tide to come in and take her. This is what she decided to do. When she was under that blanket, she felt somebody pull on the blanket. She threw it off. She looked around. And she thought to herself, I must be losing it. There's nobody here. So she put the blanket over again. Again, somebody pulled on the blanket. She looked around. There's no tracks, nothing. She hadn't eaten for days. She hadn't slept. She was crying. She was thinking, I'm losing my mind. So she put the blanket over again the third time. And this time she looked in a little hole in the blanket. She saw an old man coming out of the water, coming towards her. And he's just about ready to pull the blanket. She said, I see you. He said, I see you too. What you're doing? You try to drown yourself or something? They scare each other, Grandma said. And she started to cry. She said, yes, I want to go. And she told them the story about the two babies that died at the hands of their father. He sat down there with her. He comforted her. He said, my girl, go back to your camp there, he said. When you get there, you know, there's going to be a little plate there with a little stone. You could see through it, that stone. I want you to make a fire. Make that fire red hot. Make a hot coals. And put that stone on there. And make it red hot too, he said. And take your little cup. You got a little birch bark cup. Put water inside. I want you to get two sticks. Pick up that red hot rock there. Throw it in your mouth and drink water right down behind it. Swallow it, he said. Here he went back into the water. She sat there for a while, thinking to herself, is this my imagination? What's going on? So she packed up her blanket. 
She walked back to her camp, and just as the old man had instructed her and told her, there was a plate there, birch bark plate, with a little stone like a crystal could see through it. So she carried out his instructions. She started the fire, she heated up the stone, got the water ready, two sticks ready. And she thought to herself, maybe he's going to help me do this quick, take my life quick. So she threw the rock in, drank water down behind, swallowed it. It never burned her lips or her throat, even when she swallowed it into her stomach. She never felt a thing. And for the first time in many days, she slept like a baby. When she got up, she was even hungry. She rustled up some food. Now the old lady told me, it's not long, she said. Here she feels something inside. That's a baby moving. What? Here she was pregnant. And she carried out the same instructions as the old lady told her. She was sleeping in the afternoon one day. She grew big fast. She was sleeping under the tree. Here she gave birth to baby, boy, who's a raven, raven boy. She gave birth to him. And for people that know the story about raven, he brought light to the world. That's the story. So if you'll just take a few minutes, friends, to reflect. What does this story mean from the past, for now, and for the future? And while you're doing the reflection, I'll just sing this little healing song quietly for you. Nadia. So friends, if there's um, anybody that wants to venture forth, and I always, uh, whenever I do workshops with people, and there's a question or answer period, I always um, tell them that I will only answer the questions that I can. <laughs> anybody would like to share what they've discovered, what they have heard with their own ears, what they saw with their own mind's eye, and what they feel in their heart. What does this story mean? What inner meanings does it have for this day that we're living? Please share. Pierre Cornance, I think, is that how you say your name? That's right. Okay. I, um, I'm speaking because there have been suicides here that um, have been so hard for everybody um, just recently, like just in the last month, three young men, two of them brothers, 
So it almost feels like a story that I'm needing to hear and the things that struck me in the past was just that overwhelming sadness, that overwhelming grief. And in the present, the hope that there's something that we're meant to take in, that we're meant to so that we can have that light in the future. But if there's any insight that you had from Grandma Smith's story, I guess I would love to hear what what maybe helped you back those in those days and those years? I think what I I recognized is that many people didn't had no way in which to tell their family how deep their grief was. And the other thing that I recognize in speaking with Grandma Kitty is that a lot of people no longer had a spiritual protection. And I'm making reference to being mindful every day of what they have, not what they don't have. Mm -hmm. And also asking for help and asking for prayers and recognizing that we need each other. She realized that, you know, like in the story, the old man, who is the old man? The ancient of days, who's always there that vast sea of knowledge, the sea of cleansing, but also, she said, and people have to work together so that they can be strong. And sometimes people, she said, don't be afraid because they want to go to the other side because that's a good place but they're supposed to stay here to do something. So you have to encourage them to find out what you're supposed to do. That's how she explained it to me. So this story was, was a door opening for me to talk to her about that. Thank you so much. Said. Actually, I had very similar questions to Louise, and I wanted to connect that to the situation of the Black Lives Matters. What, uh, Louise, what you describe is what happens during the disconnect to the spirituality. And I think um, historically, the same thing has, has happened to the uh, Black community. Somehow, when they've been able to take away the spirituality out of the community, they've totally destroyed that community. And I think this is what we see as a domination is when you take the spirituality out, you can collapse. That's, is that how it is within the indigenous as well? Yes. Um, although probably I would say in the last 30 years, there's been such a reformation such a reclamation of traditional spiritual understanding and working together. I, I can honestly say that the, the suicide rate in the Yukon 
has definitely decreased because people have found themselves within a cultural context of a community and where they feel that they can share their burden with others and celebrate celebrate their with their songs celebrate with their understanding of the spiritual teachings of their people and how good people we are i think in many instances um, people who become suicidal, they, they think there is no hope. They feel helpless, hopeless, and hapless. That they cannot change things. But with a friend, with a group of friends, we can change a lot of things. We can change the world just by that small group. And I think that um, another aspect too is, and, and I just can say this, and, and I'm sure that Sylvie has witnessed this as well in the Yukon. I think there was a time when Indigenous people really didn't care for themselves, didn't love themselves. And you feel that so strongly now. You feel that they actually care about themselves. They're part of this beautiful, gifting to the world by the creator he's given them life he's given them these things that they can go forward and be uh, in positions to help others to serve their community in all different aspects i i witnessed that mm. gonna change louise mm -hmm. for your story it was really wonderful thank you very much um and I was just <clears throat> thinking, um, actually forgot the, the start of it was um, kind of in, in, uh, in relation to suicide um, because I just got so immersed in the story um, so quickly. Uh, for me, um, I just felt that it had so much to do with um, personal fulfillment um, and how, you know, we often get so wrapped up in our, um, earthly needs and desires mm -hmm. thinking we know all of that and uh you know with the parallelism with the the older lady and the younger um wife definitely you know is uh was a really good analogy i thought of you know of um of us always kind of being in a rush thinking we know what is what is good and what is what should be happening in our life <laughs> yeah um and definitely, I think at a time like this, especially with the COVID crisis, with many uh, communities um, and family members living in isolation, and um, you know, there's good things and bad things that are coming from this situation. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, just, I guess, you know, just the ending was was so um, was so beautiful with the with an absolute optimal ending. Right, she gave birth to to the crow, which was which brought the world, which brought light. So, I have a a couple of you know um, things that um, I want to share, and um, you know, in relationship to suicide, um, my mom had taken a lot of pills and was walking into the ocean, you know. And um, because of, you know, like what Louise said, hopelessness and despair, and whatever, because she, she worked out, she was an activist, you know, and uh, worked for, you know, um, justice and equity. You know, we went through the fishing rights, you know, here in Washington State and went through the takeover of Alcatraz and Fort Lawton here in Seattle. And my mom was at the lead of you know of that and, and she did a lot of great things but but education and all these things weren't making any difference for for our people and my my mom just saw no hope for our people and she was so in such despair 
that she decided that she wanted to, you know, kill herself. And so she'd taken pills already and was getting to walk into the water. And she went, oh, my God, I have, I have Clara's, um, I have Clara's um, book. And, and she, you know, for some strong reason, my mom said, I need to take this book to Clara. And so Clara um, was a Baha'i. And when my mom showed up at her door, you know, she could see my mom was in trouble. And so she took care of her, you know. And, um, you know, she'd been around Clara for a while, and Clara was behind, and she'd heard these things. But only after she'd had this, you know, um, attempt at suicide and was loved by Clara and her family, and they took care of her, that her heart opened to, you know, the teachings. And, and she found hope for our people in, the, in our teachings. And that's what she taught, you know, me and my children and my grandchildren and now my great-granddaughter. You know, we all have hope. We all have hope and we have a vision of a better time, you know. So, you know, um, the w way we've had, you know, a lot of suicides in our in our family, you know, um, but um, this is how it turned out for for my mom, you know, and for and for our our family, and I'm so grateful that Clara Tyler was was there for her to to give her um, the wisdom of the blessed beauty, you know, and the words of Abdul Baha when she read those words of Abdul Baha that you must attach great importance you know, to teaching American Indians that when they become educated and guided, they'll become so enlightened, they'll illumine the world. When she saw that, then she saw the hope for our people, you know. And you could see it in her life that mom became enlightened and illumined the world, you know. So it's not something in the future that's going to happen for Native people, you know. Ali Nakshivani told us that each one of us you know, each one of us, Native people, right now are doing the enlightening and the illumining of the world. So on, a, on another level, you know, personally looking at that story, um, I'm working on social economic development and uh, social justice and social action. And in it, you know, studying it, I'm also uh, in that book 13, and I might get the quote wrong, but um, not absolutely right. But it says, um, among the teachings of Baha'u'llah um, is that civil, civil, material civilization, material civilization is one of the means of the progress of the world, of mankind. Yet until it is combined with divine civilization, The results, which is the felicity of the world of mankind, will not be attained, you know. And I see in this story, you know, I see the, the chief as the material civilization, you know, because material civilization just produces death. It's not alive. And it's when you combined it, you know, with the... With the um, spiritual, I mean, the divine civilization, you know, that, that the world is alive, you know? And so, and so I see that hope and I see the creation of divine civilization and I see my place and my purpose in creating that divine civilization is that to see the hope the hope and the revelation and to give that hope to others you know in our way too with our songs with our drums with our ceremonies you know to be included and accepted a part of the Baha'i community because for a 
for so much of my time in the faith, you know, our diversity, we're tolerated, but we're not embraced and accepted for our diversity, you know. So, um, Louise, I'm hoping it's okay if I sing a song in my language that is now a medicine song for me. So, as I become Baha'i, because I grew up in the ghetto in the urban area of Seattle, I wasn't raised around tradition. I wasn't raised around my grandmothers or anything. But as I travel taught and pioneered to Alaska, the revelation in Baha'u'llah gifted me my culture back to me. So I learned a prayer when I was travel teaching in Port Simpson. The Canadians there gave me a copy of a Simshian song in writing and in tape that the, that the Canadian Baha'i community had made. And so I, I learned it and I, um, I was again, I was in a place of committing suicide. And, um, and while I was, you know, grieving, you know, uh, the melody for this, for this prayer song came to me. So to me, this is, is a new medicine song for our people. No. Oh, Naguadi, oh, Naguadi, oh, Naguadi. Thank you, Usham Dumpty, Shashuk Wahupsham, Lahushi, Arshuk Wahipen, Biahushi, Noon Goon Dadam Skip, Deals Not Again, Hona Gwadi, Hona Gwadi, Hona Gwadi. Ho na gwadi, dainki lusham dumpti, shashuk wahupsham, lahoshi, alashuk wahipen, biahoshi. Noon goon dadam skit, deals not again. Ho na gwadi, ho God, guide me, protect me, make of me a shining lamp and a brilliant star. Thou art the mighty and the powerful at the Baha. Thank you, Mary. Masitro. Well, I'm really enjoying all the authentic responses that I'm hearing. Mary, that was beautiful. And I love seeing the water and thinking of the metaphor of the story and how in the story, the water seemed to symbolize the kind of the spiritual guidance, a new form of guidance. The old woman seemed to be the maternal practical um, advice giving, but then she needed something else as well. And during this story, I was relating more to the young woman and the sense of preparation and sacrifice. But then afterwards, I thought of my colleague who was an art teacher who killed himself this week and his two teenage daughters. And in thinking about the point of view of the father in the story, it made me wonder 
you know, what kind of desperation leads to something like murder or suicide? And um, perhaps you could speak a little bit more about how we can uh, reach out to people before these things happen. You know, I had no idea my colleague was suffering. And then we read about it in the newspaper, you know. So I guess for me, I'm also reflecting on the white privilege that I've known in my life and how I need to get to deeper levels of understanding how that colors my life compared to someone else's life. And so it's, it's a wonderful time to learn to listen more acutely, I guess, to others and to try to help them, help the world. So it seems like the world is desperate in some ways. Thank you for that news. I'm sure that the news that was heard in the sky world was as much of an impact as it was to you. If there was a newspaper in the sky world that a father had taken the life of two of his baby sons. So I suppose part of it and known like when I worked as a mental health nurse, you know, there, there are signs, there are signs that people are becoming suicidal. And uh, there are specific signs. And if you go to any uh, mental health uh, institution, institute uh, where they have materials, one of the signs is um, they start to give things away. And they do get depressed. People do get depressed. And uh, they're depressed probably for a long time because they cannot see, they cannot see Raven being born who gives a light. You know, it's, uh, there's, there's, always, there's always light in the darkness. That's how you can appreciate the light, is that it has to come from darkness. That's, that's my understanding of it. But uh, just getting back to people who might be suicidal, they can be very depressed for a long time. They can be grieving. They can be very full of despair. And they also isolate themselves. So I think that uh, with this whole business of, um, you know, social distancing and isolation and, and uh, having to stay home and isolate yourself, for people who have... Um, who have these tendencies, perhaps it's even accentuated. Even a phone call could help that connection, could help save a life. Because people, as I've said before, you know, they become hopeless. They don't see there's any hope. Um, and then they can't help themselves. But one of the, one of the um, things that is definitely uh, a sign that people have decided you start giving everything away but then they when they get happy they you, you'll see a person has become happier i suppose is because they've made they've made a decision to do it it's like when she made the decision to do it and they and the old woman helped her that she was going to take her own life and this is the most dangerous time and for the family, so part of my job was to do um, suicide prevention. And that's when you give them the signs and tell them about that. And then there's intervention, when you can actually intervene and ask the, ask the person outright. I think oftentimes, and people are afraid to ask others, do you feel like taking your own life? Do you feel like killing yourself? Maybe nobody has ever asked them. And it's a, sad, it's a sad situation that we have to ask somebody if, they, if they're feeling suicidal. And so we have to, I guess, muster up the courage to ask our fellow human being if they don't want to live anymore. And to tell them that we want them to live. Perhaps nobody has told them that. So these were some of the things that we're able to do. And as I said, you know, there's intervention. There's first of all, prevention. Prevention is the best prevention. I think Mary's, um, Mary talked about this. And, um, 
you know, Lisa also talked about this, is that part of community, community endeavors, staying close to each other, um, becoming a unified force, so that when you don't see somebody for a while, and you say, hey, where's, where's Anne? You know, let's give her a call. Let's FaceTime her or let's go over to her place. You know, of course, in the social isolation and stuff like this, it, it's not so easy to do. But look at us. How many of us here, over 30 people, are having a conversation? Seriously, we couldn't fit all, everybody into your living room to do this. It's forbidden, actually, in this part of the world to have more than 10 people together. So, uh, so yeah. Educate yourself. All of us, all of us can be helpers to our fellow being. Educate ourselves. Be there. And do not be afraid of people crying. You know, sometimes people get very uncomfortable when somebody's crying and they don't know what to do. And the thing is, is that to relieve yourself of the burden of having to fix somebody, because part of the fixing is they know they have support, they will fix themselves. And you just have to accompany them. The House of Justice tells us that. We must accompany. They accompany us, we accompany them to get to that. I suppose get to that C. Let's see. Nobody's talked about the old man. <laughs> I was just thinking that I feel like for me, this story really rests on the fact that she listened to the old man, that she did what he told her to do. Why did she do that? You know, like, why should she? swallow something how is that going to make her feel better you know but she trusted him she had faith in him um and for me i think that that for me that's that's one of the main lessons for me in the story you know is that where is that place that we can trust who can we trust what source can we trust otherwise we're just going to be relying on ourselves and if she did that, if she relied on herself and she felt that she knew best, she wouldn't be here. She would have gone through with it. Um, and I, I think that this is one of the great, the greatest gifts of having a spiritual path is that you have a source that you put above yourself. It is your authority. You believe that it knows better than you do. And when you can't see the light, it can, and it knows what is right. And if we follow these teachings, if we swallow the pill, <laughs> it reminded me actually in Tai Chi, they talk about swallowing the bitter pill. Oh no, I thought about that when she was swallowing the pill. You know? If we swallow, if we swallow, if we, if we take the medicine that doesn't seem to make any sense to us, but that's hard, I think, in this society because people feel like they know best. Uh, and it's hard to have that humility and that trust and that faith. And of course, you don't want to put it in just anybody. It's, that's not, you know, you got you to gotta trust that source. But anyway, that to me was really, that was sticking out to me. And I appreciated that part of the story a lot. Yeah, well, I, I went through many years of depression and anxiety and panic attacks. And, and I tried to kill myself a number of times. And... Uh, I'm I was glad here. What's that? I'm glad you're still with us. Well, it ties in with the story too, because um, um, the time I almost left this world, I took a lot of pills and I was on an IV drip. I was in a coma for two and a half days. My mom stayed in the hospital the whole time. But I had a dream actually where I have a lot of dreams that number of them come true but this one i had a i was married and we actually stayed in your basement apartment louise up in yeah and uh 
So we had a, a, a cat and um, the cat in the dream came to me and turned into a crow and had a burning pine needle in its beak. Oh. <laughs> and it was burning, but it wasn't being consumed. It was an eternal fire. And the minute she handed me, the minute this cat turned into a crow, handed me this, I looked over to my left and I was looking at this lake with a, a lot of the water had been, it was like a drought. And I saw people walking way up and the further they were up, there were people walking at different places on, on the shore. And the further they were up on the shore, further down, the further they were in the future. Mm. Mm. So, I mean, I, I think, you know, there's, there's things that I have to do. So I wasn't allowed to end my life. And I think all of us as Baha'is really have been given that burning pine needle. Yes. Yes. And, and we um, are supposed to bring it to as many people as we can. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. Hi, Donna. Hi, Louise. How are you? Really good. How about you? Yeah, very good. Um, I would like to make just a comment following on from what Jessica was saying about trusting in God and having that relationship. Um, there's also a step before that about giving yourself permission about doing the work with yourself and giving yourself permission that you're allowed to have this relationship you're allowed to have this faith it is okay you're allowed to be happy you're allowed to have strength you're allowed to have belief in your 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 uniqueness but you've got to give yourself permission to um to walk that pathway hi Deirdre. I'm Louise, thank you for that very moving and meaningful story. It, I just to tell a quick story. My dear niece three years ago gave birth to a baby boy who died while he was being born. And she held in her arms this perfect dead baby. And of course I was with her and her heart was broken. And I felt a kind of, you feel a kind of rage against the uncle who took that baby. This baby is perfect. Why did you need to, to take this baby? The next year, on the very same day that Matthew Gabriel died, she gave birth to twin daughters. Aww. <laughs> Aww. With a great joy and terror of her life as, as twins are. Yes. And, you know, there's that kind, to me, it's that kind of alternating reality of life of the cruelty that you know you you log a few years and you see there's there's terrible suffering in life and the the the, the second the first wife there's also incredible tenderness and love and people who are there to look after you and to to smooth this passage and there's also that masquerading red hot stone that you think, are you crazy? I'm not going to take this. I'm not going to take this faith. I'm supposed to give up all kinds of things. I'm supposed to change my life. And you swallow it and it gives birth to something more beautiful than anything you could have imagined. But it's that passage of, of terrible despair alternating with great tenderness and ending hopeless that often for us is the passage we have to go through to get to the faith. I think for many of us, it, it was a, a very painful time before we learned to trust Baha'u'llah because basically we were by the side of a river with a gopher skin over our head thinking, I don't want to do this anymore. And yeah. And then that extraordinarily wise man comes to us. So thank you, Louise. I mean, it, the story made me cry. It made me really angry. <laughs> and it also filled me with, with joy and tenderness. Thank you. Thank you, Deirdre. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Very wonderful insights. 
Thank you, Louise. Merci Chou for the story. Um, there was different level, maybe, or different aspect for me for the story, but it, it centered around um, as uh, resilience, as uh, when people in our family are dealing with addiction and how uh, this old man and, and the suffering and, you know, the trying once of a treatment and the trying once a uh, second time of a treatment and it still doesn't work. Yeah. And then this person that gets isolated, but maybe the person need that time, that time to reflect. Mm -hmm. And when it's interesting, because just before the workshop, I was talking with a neighbor on exactly this, the right timing. Yes. The the God that a person has to see what whatever that God means, yes. if it's yes. nature or something. But that thing that all of a sudden gives a meaning to the life of a person. And um, so as a parent, you see that suffering and you just want to help. But this was also a lesson for me as a parent that I need to go to that nature too, to nurture the spiritual, to drink, to take that stone a little bit because I've lost it uh, by always trying to help you know or not help but you know what i mean guides yes yes, yes. all this yes, yes. So it's time for that stone right now yes and uh, for the light to come back thank you louise yes and so thank welcome. you everybody because uh, this is so great to be with a community of people from all over the world from all divers um uh, stories and background it's it's beautiful thank you i want to really thank everybody for their courage uh to come to something i mean i know there's probably several people there that know what traditional storyteller storytelling is about they probably had the privilege many have had privilege to hear story uh the thing i want to end with though is that we are all stories. We are a story in process. And I remember one of my beautiful mentors, Angela Sidney, who I always pay homage to. She said, Louise, live your life like a story so that when you go, people are gonna tell a good story about you. <laughs> what she was saying to me is that you know, life could be tough, but that's a good story when you make your way through it. And a storyteller can't tell his or herself a story. You have to give it away. So I think if there's anything that I can, this is a takeaway for me, is that I have to share more stories so that I can hear other people's stories, like the people who trusted this process to come and talk about their grievances, talk about their grief, talk about the times when they were suicidal, talk about their the community is suffering so much and how to reach out to that community. Yeah. It was a privilege for me. It was an honor for me to be with all of you tonight. And um, I really want to thank you, Jessica, for stepping forward and taking the pill, or the, not the pill, but the hot stone of courage. That's what it is. You have to be courageous to swallow the fire. And it will not burn you. It will only keep you alive. So I wish you all a very good evening. Probably for some, it's still early afternoon. <laughs> and um, yeah, I also wanted to say, you know, with so many elders who passed away in all of these retirement homes, now they're all on the other side. I know we might not have known them. Maybe we did know a few. Um, but when, when elders leave this world, they still hang on to you, take care of you.
You can call on them anytime. They don't have a watch. They don't have appointments. They're just there for you. So call on them to help you and help others. I see. Thank you. Good night. Miigwech, miigwech. Thank you so much, Louise. That was the way that you're able to take that feeling in that story and put it right into us was healing. Thank you for that. Much appreciated. Much appreciated. And thank you, everybody else, for being here and for participating. And for all of you who are watching this at home, we really, you know, of course, we this wouldn't be here without all of you. And if you would like to learn more about the upcoming programs through Green Acre, please visit our website, greenacre.news. You'll see what's coming up. We've got an art show coming up soon called Pupil of the Eye, which is a reference to people of the African diaspora, people of African descent and how they're able to see in a way that other people are not able to see. So check out our website uh, for that. And Louise, is, do you have a website? Can people go to your website? Do you have a website? We need a website, Louise. We need to make you up. <laughs> I have a Facebook site, but I don't have there a website. There you go. Yeah, that's, well, I, I hope that we have you back. I hope that you will honor us with your presence again in the future because it's uh, we need that healing. We all need that. There's, a, there's something that story does that nothing else quite does. So thank you. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a wonderful night. We'll see you next time. Yeah. Take care. Bye-bye.